Um, so the passage of scripture I chose today, it's kind of, it's not one of the typical ones where you're seeing Jesus interact with somebody, healing them or whatever. It's, it's John 17 that's focused on Jesus's prayer. And um, it's the entire chapter. It's the longest prayer ever recorded. But I think it's cool because we're looking at a couple things when we're looking at Jesus, right? One of them is that we're looking at, you know, what, why did John choose to record this? It's not recorded in any of the other gospels. Um, what's he wanting to convey to us as disciples who are about, you know, thousands of years from this particular point in history? What, what's, What's the message? And, and we already know when John was recording, we know it wasn't chronological, most of it. We also know that um, John used different language about the miracles. He called them signs because he was communicating the idea that these miracles were not the thing in and of themselves. It was pointing to something, right? Pointing to someone. and. Um, and in this particular chapter, which I'm sure you've all read at some point, um, this is Jesus is praying this prayer before he's about to be led to be crucified, right? So you had John chapter 13, where he washes their feet. Then you have John 14, 15, and 16, where he goes through this whole thing about, um, you know, being troubled and... He's basically preparing them, have heart, take heart, because when I go, the spirit is going to come in my place. You're not going to be left alone. You know, where are you going? Why can't we come with you, Jesus? Um, you know, that whole thing where, where, you know, where we even get the famous line, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So we know that Jesus has spent all this time teaching the stuff, preparing them for the fact that they are going to be left. But don't worry, because the Spirit's going to come. And then, you know, I never thought about this before, um, which I don't know why I never thought about it. Maybe you're like, duh, Melanie, and we've all thought about that. <laughs> but in this particular passage of scripture, like the very last line of John 16, or the very last thing Jesus says in John 16, is he it, he's speaking, um, uh, that's not what I wanted. In verse 29 of John 16, it says, Then Jesus' disciples said, Now you are speaking clearly and without figures of speech. Now we can see that you know all things and that you do, you do not even need to have anyone ask you questions. This makes us believe that you came from God. So in those last three that I mentioned, you know, 13, 14, 15, 16, Jesus doesn't use any parables. He doesn't, he just speaks very plainly to them. And, and they say, John wants us to know that they, they're like, ah, now we believe, right? Now we get it. We're not, you don't even, we don't even need to ask you questions. Like, what do you mean? Um, because if you remember in John, I think it's 14, where he says, I'm going to the Father and you cannot come yet. And they're like, why can't we come? Now they're like, okay, Jesus, we get it. We understand everything you're saying makes sense to us now, right? And then he goes into this prayer. Now, the thing I never consciously realized before was um, this prayer is recorded by somebody who obviously witnessed it. Like they heard this prayer because if they didn't, then they wouldn't have been able to record it. So I don't know what the setting did, because it doesn't say Jesus left. He said, after he said this, all that he had got done saying, and if you go back to those passages, those chapters, there's a lot of red if you ever read, you know, book, Bible, and the red being where Jesus speaks. There's a lot of red, <laughs> right? And so he's in this environment where he said all this stuff to them. And then he, he looks up to God, and, and it says, he looked up to heaven and he prayed. And so 
maybe he said to them, guys, let's pray. I don't know what the scenario was, but in this moment of explaining all these intense things to them and then them going, okay, I think we finally get it. We, I think we get it. He prays. Now, remember Tony was talking about one of his lessons was how often Jesus had to repeat himself to the disciples over and over and over and over again. He had to tell them, guys, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. And he specifically on this day and on the third day, and then, you know, he talked about how then Jesus resolutely walked toward Jerusalem. I think it was the Sunday sermon. So this depiction of him walking toward Jerusalem is a little bit different because it's showing a different aspect of that journey toward Jerusalem. And he says, he looks up to heaven and he says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might Give eternal life to all those you have, you, excuse me, to all those you gave him. Now, this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have been brought, I, I brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. So he tells them essentially a lot of what he's just prayed, but then he turns to God and he prays these prayers. And, and I think to myself, what, what, what was Jesus doing? Like, why was he praying this prayer to like to God but around them what was he what was his message well as you continue reading John chapter 7 he goes into the fact that he is no longer going to be with them that he is going to be with united with the father that they're still going to be in the world but he reminds them of things that they've never really ever been of the world since they've been with him. They've been in the world, but they've never been of the world, right? They have been following him. And so he, it's almost like through his prayer, he's reminding them, I'm going, the Father's gonna send the Spirit. And, and so many times he talks about the Spirit in this John 17. The Father's gonna send the Spirit and this Spirit that's gonna be with you is gonna keep us all united. I'm with the Father, the Father is in me. He's also going to be with you. And as long as you guys are one and you continue to do this, the Spirit is always going to be with you. I'm always going to be with you. And remember, God is always going to be with you. And so there's this, there's this connection between God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. And he does this a beautiful job of showing them what that looks like when he's gone like sh just this practical don't fear never fear that you are alone it's about to get really intense and things are going to be really difficult and your path is going to become really difficult don't forget the father is always going to be there and i am going back to where i left he's like i I left there and I came down here for a purpose. And I, the purpose is, and when you read, it's like, God, I've done what you've asked me to do. I've said the things, the words that you gave me to say. So let's, let's keep reading. I can paraphrase, but so he gets finished with that section. And then he says, just what I was saying to you, I've revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. So he's talking about the disciples. So I've revealed you to the disciples, to these men. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. So everything I've taught you guys, it, it came from God. 
For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. They believed that I was the one who was proclaimed thousands, hundreds of years ago. They believed I was the fulfillment of prophecy. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me. So this particular moment, I'm not praying for anybody else, but for them. Again, if I am them, if I am them and I'm listening, I'm feeling very comforted by those words because it's specifically, it's like, you know, I don't know, it's a pale comparison, but like when I'm with somebody and I'm praying and we've just done talking about this intense thing going on in their life, right? That it's painful to them. Maybe we've even shed some tears together. And then we bow our heads together and we pray. When I'm the person that is being prayed for, there's, there's a comfort that I feel from that prayer that's even greater than the comfort of us talking to each other. You know, like there's a certain level of comfort I feel that I got to unburden myself with a, a sister. But when they pray for me, there's almost like this, it solidifies that, okay, this is gonna be okay. You know, all, almost like the conversation, God didn't hear it. I, I don't know, there's a special comfort that comes from knowing that this person is praying for me and I can hear that prayer, right? I'm joined in that prayer. Um, verse 10, all I have is yours and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them by the power of your name. Um, if you are reading from your um, phone, it has like a little thing beside it. And it's usually another way of translating that phrase. And it, it says in John um, 17, 11, instead of protect them by the power of your name, it says, keep them faithful to the power of your name. Which is interesting, right? Because protect them has this, uh, has this, I don't know, it's a self-focused sort of protect me from harm, right? Like when I think of protect them, I almost think to myself, keep danger away from them. But when you read a different translation of it that says, keep them faithful too, that's a different meaning to me. That doesn't mean danger is going to be taken from me. To me, that means no matter what comes my way, no matter what danger comes my way, that God is going to keep me faithful to that. God is going to protect my faith through that, not protect my physical being or, you know what I'm saying? It, like when I was reading it, I thought, oh, wow, that, that's different. I see that differently. And that's partially because of the challenge of translation, trying to get that exact meaning across to us. So it is always really good to look at different translations. Or if you're lazy like me, look at those three dots that gives you a different. Um, verse 12, while I was with them, I protected them and, and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that scripture would be fulfilled. I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word and the world has hated them for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Let's continue going down and we'll, we'll talk about Jesus' prayer for us, right? My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one, 
as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. There's a connection between Jesus's, you and I are one, you know, you, me, the spirit, we're one. I've given them what you told me to give them. Why? So that they too can be in, as one. And therefore they pass on that message of unity to other people. It says, then the world, this idea of us being unified, he says, then the world will know that you sent me and have loved me even as you have loved me. You love you loved them even as you've loved me. Father, I want those you've given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Wow, I, I'm like, even when I read that, these verses, right? And I think that's, that was Jesus's heart. That's what he desired for them to know. There's a lot of times when people are going through difficulty and I shy away from reminding them that God is with them, that, that the whole reason Jesus came was to, to, to bring God closer to us, right? Not, not that God's far away, but that Jesus brought closer, God close to humanity so humanity could understand God. And Jesus is saying that's never, that's not, now that I'm gone, now that I'm up in heaven, that's not changed. But sometimes I hold back from sharing, you know, when someone's crying or they're hurting over something, remember that God is with you. Almost like saying that I'm communicating this, this pat answer to their problems. Like, and yet that's what Jesus, Jesus didn't take out any kind of poetry or like, you know, it was, he reminded them of the power, the love, the only power and love that could truly take human beings through a difficult time or elevate their thinking from their worldly problem to heaven was to remind them of where their power comes from, where their peace comes from, where their joy comes from. That's what he did. And yet for some reason, I as a human being shy away from that kind of communication, right? I, I want to somehow use my physical presence or my love for them or, you know, other things <laughs> to bring them a sense of comfort. When in reality, it is God. And I'm doing them the best service by communicating that to God. But I know why I do that because sometimes we have even said as disciples, you know, I don't need you to tell me that I, I need to trust God. I know that. We've said that to each other, right? And we've said that about each other when we're saying, I don't need somebody to tell me to trust God. I trust God. Do we though? Like, do we in that moment? Do we really trust God? Maybe, maybe it's really in that moment that we need to hear that. But we're frustrated. And I think our spirit knows we don't trust God. And when somebody says it to us, it frustrates us because our spirit already knows. You don't. That's why you're in this anxious place because you're not trusting me in this moment. So it's just, it's an interesting thing to me to consider. And this chapter of John, like when I was trying to study it, it's so, there's so many things written about it and so many commentaries. And it's a very complex, theologically complex chapter. Like, I didn't know that. 
So I started trying to study it. And honestly, after reading some of the papers, I just was like, no, that's, that's not going to be helpful. <laughs> like, I can't, I can't draw any, you know, it, it was like, that's just for another time. That's for a deeper sense of study. But, but what struck me was, why did Jesus want them to hear this prayer? You know, we know right after this, if you go read John 18, right after this, he goes off. And we know from Matthew that he goes off with Peter, James, and John. So the rest of them aren't with him. And he has that moment where he prays to God three times. We know from that moment that they're with him, but they're not with him, right? For, for whatever reason, he wanted them to hear this prayer and, and feel this moment and join with him in his prayer to God in this moment. And when you go back and read 14, 15, 16, you go, ah, okay. He really was preparing them. There was a lot emotionally he was trying to get them ready for. And it's different. John is preparation for them is different than Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Right? You don't you don't get this in all those other books. They they present the journey toward Jerusalem in a different way. So if that's an important thing for us, I think, when we're reading the Gospels is to say, well, why was Mark, why did Mark want us to know this? What's particular about this that it means something to us? And the same with this prayer that's recorded. What, what message, aside from the obvious that Jesus is communicating in his prayer, it's like, why did he want us to hear this prayer and know this prayer? And so first, why did he want them to hear it? And then what does that mean for us today? And it's, it's powerful to me because for me, what I, what I walked away from is me connecting people back to God and reminding people that in your darkest moment, it's not me, although I'm a part of your comfort. It's not me. It's really God I need to connect you to. And me connecting you to God is not a pat, easy answer to your trials. It is the answer. It's not my lazy solution to give you because I don't know what else to say. It is what you need to hear because it is where your, pop, your comfort, your power, your faith, your strength comes from. And I am doing whoever I'm with a disservice if I shy away from sharing those things for fear that I'm going to offend you or make you feel like I don't care and I'm lazy, I'm being lazy in giving you God as the solution, right? So I don't know, maybe for you, you don't shy away and it, but for me, and maybe because I have, I do it so much, it's a part of my role that I'm constantly bringing about some sort of comfort because I, I don't have any problems taking people back to God when they're having a problem in their marriage, when they're in sin, when like, like I have no problems directing people back to God almost in any other circumstance, but when they need comfort. For some reason, I will tend to tag that to the end of my counsel. Like I will hear them, I will com physically comfort them, I'll remind them, you know, of all that God has done in their life. Like I'll do that kind of stuff, but then when it comes to actually saying how you are going to deal with this, how you're actually going to, to make it through this, is God and taking them through scripture on God, God's power, God's love, reminding them. You're not alone. God's with you. you. You do have power to overcome. You are able to get through this. So anyways, that was my takeaway. <laughs> um, any thoughts before we close out? <laughs>